Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad you made it here. Rumor has it, sun's going to make an appearance sometime next week, so we're all looking forward to that. Uh, it's always great to be in God's house. Please stand, greet one another with God's peace. Remain standing for our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made Amen. heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered here to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace. 
lives from above and for our salvation let us pray to the lord for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of god and for the unity of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. We pray. Almighty God, you know that we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading appointed for this fourth Sunday of the Epiphany comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb in the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. 
But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to be God. Epistle reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the eighth chapter. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through their former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, 
and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Another answer? Uh huh. Mom and, Mom and Dad. Very good. Our parents. We're going to hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so, where do you receive your instruction and your information? Where do you receive that? Those things? Uh huh. Somebody else want to answer? Where? Who? Who gives? God gives us instruction and information too, doesn't He? Uh huh. 
Oh, Jesus, he does. Very good. You guys are on it this morning. Well, I want to tell you that we can get instruction and information from a lot of different places. Sometimes if I want to know what's going on right around my community, I read the newspaper and I find out what's going on right in my community. If there's something I really want to research, I find a magazine that has a lot of information about that and I read that magazine. If I want to learn more about gardening, I'll find a gardening book and I read the details about that. I can learn a lot by reading this book. I can go to the library and there's just shelves and shelves of books that I can learn from. We can learn by even going to our computer or our phone. Who do we ask if we go to our computer or our phone? Google, Google. that's what we do, we Google and find out information. We have to be a little careful about learning from those sources. It might not be real trustworthy. You find that out sometimes. It isn't quite the truth or all as accurate as it should be. So there's some sources that we have, and you guys already named them, that we have as a gift from God. We have our parents, and we have teachers, our school teachers, our Sunday school teachers, and we have our pastors that give us information and um, they help us learn more things. And those are all authorities that God has given us. They can be way more trusted. Ooh, ooh, I used kind of a big word there, authority. What is authority anyway? Does somebody know what authority is? I had to look it up too, to be honest. The definition I came up with is that it's the power or right to teach to give orders, or to make decisions. When I read that definition, the first thing that came to my mind is the police. They have authority, don't they? They have been given authority to make sure that we keep the law. And if I don't do that, then I might receive a ticket, or even be put in jail if I refuse to do what they're deciding or telling me should be done according to the law. Well, we have a wonderful reading this morning. Pastor just read it from Mark chapter 1 that has that word authority in it too. It says, and they went into Capernaum and, immediate, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching for he taught with, as one with authority. So the disciples and those that were there watching him, they were astonished. Can you give me your astonished look? You're just amazed. Good job. I see some great astonished faces here. They were astonished. They knew there was something special about the way Jesus was teaching. He was right. They knew it was right, and they knew there was something backing him up. Well, he is God, so of course he has the greatest backing God. His authority was evident, and they were astonished. They saw it. Well, then something else happened. Listen closely. They were so astonished by his teaching, and then there was a, a man in the temple, in the synagogue with them there, and he had an evil, yucky spirit inside him. Now, we all have the Holy Spirit, and he helps us know what God wants us to do and gives us strength to live according to the Lord. But this man had an evil, yucky spirit that was making him do yucky things. But that spirit even knew that Jesus was God. He said, what do you have to do with us? Did you come here to destroy us? I know who you are. Even that evil spirit knew who Jesus was. And the Jesus... The devil knew that Jesus was really God. You're yeah. right. The devil knows that too. That's connected with this evil spirit. He knew. And you know what Jesus immediately did? Get ready with your astonished look again. Jesus said, be quiet. Come out. That's what he did, and immediately the disciples were astonished again. Good astonished face. 
amazed because even the demons obeyed God. He has Jesus. He has the greatest authority. We have that same teaching. We have Jesus' word in the Bible. And I know you all and your parents are wanting you all to stay connected to that authority and that teaching because that's why you're here this morning. Why would you get up on a gloomy Sunday morning except you knew the coming to hear the teachings of Jesus is great. It's important. We need it. We want it. So I want to encourage you to stay close to the teachings of Jesus and keep learning and questioning more and more about him. You can learn from other books and other resources, but they will not have the same power or authority that the Word of God has. And I'm so glad you know that and you're here this morning. Would you please pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for showing us your authority and power. Thank you for using it for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a handout for you. Thank you for coming up. Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are well into the season of Epiphany, and we are continuing our series looking at Paul's letters. The first week of Epiphany, we looked at what Paul talks about with God's promises and what those mean for us. The second week, we looked at baptism and how we are baptized into God and what that means for us as well. Last week, we looked at the idea of undivided. We heard some good marriage advice, potentially, and what God deserves for our undivided attention with him. This week, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians once again, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to look at the idea of love and how we love our neighbors and our fellow Christians. And Paul's addressing a situation that affects us today as well, which is how do we best love our neighbors? How do we live a Christian life of love, and what does that look like? We know this passage well. You've probably heard at least portions of the passage because it has terminology that's often used within the Christian community. The idea of a stumbling block, which Paul mentions in verse 9, is often thrown around in the Christian community. I've heard it uh, said for individuals, for organizations, as looking at whether an action or some words that they're saying are going to cause a stumbling block to their fellow Christians. And that's to say, would something they do or say cause a barrier between them and God? Would something that they do distract another Christian from God? That's an important thing to be aware of. So it's important to know what could be a stumbling block. And Paul addresses that today in our reading. In our reading, Paul is addressing a situation in 2,000 years ago with the Church of Corinth where some of their members are eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. They know it's just meat. It has no meaning behind it. It will be like if we were to just be eating bacon. It's just meat. There's really nothing wrong with what they're doing. 
But Paul is a little more concerned about, not about what the action is, but about what the action could show others. Paul is concerned about what others might be perceiving of this action. And he, his advice, even though the situation may not directly apply to us, his advice, his reaction to it does. And he responds with, do not be a stumbling block. Do not put others' faith at risk. And this matters in context. Something might be a stumbling block in one context. Something might not be a stumbling block in another. Eating bacon is harmless unless you're doing it in front of your vegan friend. Then maybe it could have a little more harmful connotation. So context matters. And for us Christians, our context is that we are proclaiming God's love. We are always witnessing God's word with all of our actions and all of our deeds. Our context is very important, that we are embodying Christ's love. For many summers over while I was in college, I worked at a camp in the Rocky Mountains. And every summer we'd have a guy's night where we'd talk about what it meant to be a man of God. At the end of our first summer, the old cowboy in the room, he spoke up and he summed up all our entire conversation in one phrase. He said, always be aware of what perception you are giving. And that sums up what Paul is saying. That sums up what is being conveyed in 1 Corinthians. Always be aware of what perception you are giving. Always be aware of who's watching you. Always be aware of what they might be seeing. Because every situation is unique. Every situation is different. And for someone walking by, not knowing the context, not knowing the knowledge behind it, they might be perceiving something completely different. That's why Paul says in verse 1, he starts off with saying, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The knowledge that you know doesn't help the person perceive the situation. The Corinthians, they knew the knowledge behind eating meat. They knew that the meat was sacrificed to false idols, and as Paul says, there's no real existence to the gods behind them. It's just meat. It's harmless. They have that knowledge. But to someone perceiving the situation, to someone walking by and seeing a Christian eating this sacrificed meat, they might see a Christian partaking in idolatry. Or maybe it's a former idolater seeing their brother or sister in Christ eating the meat, and it brings them back into their sinful ways and creates a stumbling block for them. For us, it might be as simple as not singing at church. Maybe you know the knowledge behind the situation. You know whether or not you have a good voice or not. You know whether or not you like the hymn. Maybe you have a sore throat that week and you really don't want to sing the hymn. But the perception you're giving could be very different. Maybe you're giving the perception to your children that worship isn't really worth partaking in or to your neighbors that it's not worth being involved in the situation. Studies show that the best determining factor for whether a child will remain in the faith as an adult is whether or not their father sang in church. So something as simple as just singing a hymn is perceived by others has very important significance. Or maybe you have a situation like me. My old car, I used to have one of those fish uh, bumper stickers on it. It was great. Everybody driving behind me could tell that I have a relationship with God. And it was all good until I was speeding one day and got pulled over. (laughs) Now... I still have a relationship with God, but my perception being given from the side of the road maybe wasn't the most Christianly reflection on uh, respecting authority and the laws. And believe me, I knew the knowledge behind it. I knew the context. I knew I was being passed by people before I got pulled over. I knew I was following traffic. But it doesn't matter. The perception is given. The stumbling block is laid. And there's nothing I can do about it. This is a daunting task. This is an intimidating task, always being aware of what others are seeing of our lives, what others might be perceiving. But as Christians, we're called to be aware of it. We're called to go the extra mile and care about others, care about how our actions might impact others. And that's life as a Christian. And it can be a lot of work, but we're not alone in it. Paul says in verse 6 that there is no God but one and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things and through whom we exist. What Paul is saying is that we are one with Christ. We are one church, one body of Christ. 
when we do something, we represent the entire church. We represent God himself. We're not alone in this action, but we're called to represent God in a way of love, to represent a church of Christ's love. Paul says in verse 3 that if anyone loves God, he is known by God. We have this gift of being known by God. We have this gift of knowing who God is. And that brings with it a new life that Paul describes. This new life is a, a life of knowing each other, of having relationships with our brothers and sisters, with our neighbors. If you know your brothers and sisters, you know how to best love them. You know what might be a stumbling block and what might come across more as love. Relationships are important to know how to best help each other in this life. And it's not always easy. Some situations may be a little more sensitive than just speeding on the highway. Maybe having beer at a picnic, maybe that becomes a stumbling block to someone struggling with alcoholism. Or maybe you have a lot of Bible knowledge, which is very good, but that could maybe come across as intimidating to someone who is new to faith, and you need to watch how you portray it. The situations go on, and every situation is unique and has its own context. But it's easy to lay stumbling blocks on accident. And when they're laid, when they're placed, we get approached approach them from a place of love and help remove those stumbling blocks for each other. And this usually means taking the high road. Because like for the Corinthians, they really weren't doing anything wrong. You may not actually be doing anything wrong. But loving each other means loving them enough to be humble and maybe change your actions. Maybe it means sacrificing something that you enjoy. Paul says he's willing to sacrifice meat for the sake of his brother. Maybe I should be able to sacrifice speeding in the highway, or maybe it looks like sacrificing beer at a picnic. Either way, we're called to love one another and to help each other through this world. And if we need an example of what this looks like, we need to see how this plays out in action, all we need to do is look at Christ. Our Lord and Savior who humbled himself to be born to this world. Our Lord who took on the perception of a helpless human. Our God, he sacrificed himself even to death on a cross for you, for humanity, for our sin. Our God knows what it looks like to sacrifice. He gave us the ultimate sacrifice. And we get to share that love with others. We get to live as those that God has sacrificed for. And we get to share the love with others. As Paul says, love builds up. So we get to build each other up as Christ builds us up and bring ours to Christ. Now all of a sudden, this daunting task of always worrying what perception we're giving becomes a little more straightforward. If we're always living a life of love in Christ, that's what's going to be perceived. If our actions always point towards Christ, that's what people are going to see. So we get this humbling and awesome task of living a Christian life and pointing others to Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again from into the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. 
and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Holy Trinity, you are God of gods and Lord of lords. Truly, there is no God but you alone. From you and from your Son, Jesus Christ, are all things. Reveal the saving knowledge of Christ's truth to us and to the world, that loving you and one another, together we may be known by God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, give health and success to our president and governor, our legislators and judges, and all who serve for our governance and protection. Make them high in purpose, wise in counsel, and unwavering in duty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son cast out unclean spirits and taught with authority. He is the great physician of body and soul. Have mercy on those who are sick, distressed, in danger, or facing any need, especially Freya, Jim, Rick, and Bob, Micah, and Mariah, family and friends of Petra, and those we name in our hearts. Sustain them with patience, that they trust in your merciful care, and graciously, in accordance with your will, give them relief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, look with favor on all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and renewal of life, and so receive a foretaste of the feast to come. Lord, in your mercy. And into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, 
Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken, it, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. In the same manner also, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
would stand. May this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and in soul unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace.